this book this morning? All right. Got half of you anyway, Wake. All right, we're going to pick up uh, kind of where we left off a couple weeks ago, and that's what's the uh, beginning of the book of Esther. We didn't really get into it too deep, and we're going to kind of do a little introduction on it this morning and, and uh, continue to move in that direction. But I want to talk to you a little bit about lifting up your eyes this morning. Uh, last last time, two weeks ago, first of all, I want to thank Ryan, even though he's not in here anymore. He did a great job uh, Sunday, as he always does, and all the guys do when they fill in. So I appreciate that, and I hope you got something out of it. But um, Ryan always does good about balancing me out. You know, he comes at you with more of the practical stuff, and <clears throat> it's good. But uh, we, we, we cracked into the book of Esther because it was... I think I called it the unforeseen shift because it looks like, you know, in, in the flow of the Bible, we're, we're moving right through chapter to chapter. But when you look at the chronology of things, you realize that things are moving around and understanding what's going on in the world and what's going on in life helps us to place where we're at and what's going on with our walk and, and what God's doing in different areas of, of you know, the world but also Christianity with the nation of Israel, all the different aspects that come into everything God's doing. And this morning we're talking about lifting up your eyes. There are 38 verses in your Bible that talk specifically about somebody lifting up their eyes. And sometimes it's not always a good reference. There are several where it's not, because typically what happens is somebody lifts up their eyes and they see something and that visual captivation leads them somewhere that can pull you away from God. But in this particular case, in the spiritual sense, that's not how it should work. How it should work for us is the Bible talks about setting our affections on things above. And what the world is trying to do is, as I've talked about so much lately, uh, to captivate us onto what's going on here keeping you looking at a more of a, a horizontal level rather than a vertical level. But understand that what we need to be in the process of doing is lifting up our eyes and beginning to look to the sky. Because that is the next place that we will see our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And you need to get your, your attention off of the distractions that are happening. And the distractions range from what appear to be extremely good on this end to extremely destructive and, and terrible on this end. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what happens in the next day, the next week, the next month. I mean, you, depending on where you look, you can, you can find people that will tell you that, you know, the, the undercover government setup and everything that's been on hold for the last three years is getting ready to pop loose and they're going to save the, the country and save the world and all these great things are going to happen. Or you can look over here and it's talking about how, you know, the, the most evil of evils coming and it's, it's all, everything's going to crash and fall apart. And Hey, I got news for you. None of it really matters. And that's why you need to lift your eyes high. You need to lift them up and focus them on Christ because that is what matters. And I think that's what God is trying to get our attention here in the book of Esther on. And I'm going to share with you why, because there's some interesting things that go on in the book of Esther that a lot of even Christians look at the book and say, well, I wonder if that should even be part of the Bible. Now, I think Esther, if, if, if I had it my way, I'd put Esther right before Revelation. Because the book of Esther is everything that's going to happen before Revelation breaks loose. At least Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 1, 2, and 3 we know represents the church age. Esther should go between Revelation chapter 3 and Revelation chapter 4. Because it's the great shift. It's the great moving that nobody that, that uh, doesn't have a Bible believes is happening. And quite frankly, there are a lot of people that have a Bible they don't understand what's really happening right now and what's getting ready to take place. What is taking place in the book of Esther? It's the last great drawing together of the nation of Israel. 
It's also the, the preparations for the last trumpet for the church. It's also the last great call for the Gentiles. You realize there are three major things happening in the book of Esther. God is preparing Israel for what's to come, which is ultimately he wants to restore them and, and give them their, the promised land back and reign and rule over them with a, a righteous rule. But unfortunately, they have to go through the time of Jacob's trouble first. But it's, it's also the time that God is drawing together the last group of, of the church saints and preparing them for the harvest. I don't know a whole lot about farming. I've never really been on a farm too much, but I see pictures and stuff. But what do they what do they do with the sheaves of of corn or, or wheat? What's that? That's right. And what do they do with the little bundles? They tie them together. Well folks the Bible likens the rapture to a harvest. That's what God is trying to do, or not trying, that's what he is doing right now. He's gathering the last remnant of Christians, and he's cinching them down, he's bringing them together, and he's preparing for the harvest to take them out. And then thirdly, the unsaved world right now, which I know technically the Jews fall in, but the closer we get to the rapture and the tribulation, the farther the Jews are being separated out from the Gentiles. For 2,000 years, the Jews have had to follow the same procedure that a Gentile would in terms of coming to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ to have a relationship with God. But you've seen over the last, well, really since 1948, since the turn of the century, 1900, God beginning to, to make that separation back where it's the Gentiles and the, and the Jews. And what he's doing for the Gentiles, he's making one last, one last great call to find their Savior before they get pushed off into the tribulation. All three of those things are happening, and they're all happening in the book of Esther. And that's why this book is so pertinent to where we are in the time we live in today. Uh, turn with me to Romans chapter 11 first. Romans chapter 11, I'm going to pick it up in verse 8. It says, According as it is written, God hath given them, the nation of Israel, the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear, unto this day. And David saith, Let their table be made a snare, and a trap, and a stumbling block, and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened, that they may not see, and bow down their back alway. I say then, having they stumbled that they should fall, God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them be the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles insomuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify mine office. If by any means I provoke to emulation that them which are my flesh, and might save some of them. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the, uh, the receiving of them be but life from the dead? What he's, what's going on here is he's explaining what's happening to the nation of Israel during the period of the church age. They get put off, they get eyes of slumber, they get put on the back burner. God's done with them for a while. And he's turning his eyes to the Gentiles. But notice he says that their falling away is the riches of the Gentiles because it brought on salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. But notice he says uh, in, at the end of verse 12, and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness You see, God's going to reward the nation of Israel on the back end to a fullness that nobody really understands. But what I want you to see here this morning is the fact that what God did at the end of the first advent, at the end of Jesus' life, in the beginning of the book of Acts, was shift his attention from Israel to the Gentile which ultimately became the church. 
What is happening in the book of Esther is the exact opposite. Esther is all about God taking his eyes off of the Gentiles and moving his eyes back to his bride, the nation of Israel. And it's all in preparation for what he has in store for them to restore unto them their fullness that he talked about in verse 12. And that process is 70, what did we figure, 76 years, I think, 75 years in, in play right now. That's how close we are. And the book of Esther lays out precisely the, the events that are going to take place surrounding God making that shift. Now here's some interesting concepts about uh, what's going on in the book of Esther. First of all, do you notice that the, the name God or the name Lord is not mentioned one time? Isn't that interesting? So much so that the Roman Catholics under Jerome, he added six chapters to the book that's still in a, a true Roman Catholic Bible today. Six chapters he put in there that they made sure that the, the name God and the word Lord was used because they felt like that that book wasn't supposed to be there or that there was something wrong with it because it didn't mention God's name. You know why that? There are several reasons, but you know one of the major reasons why that name is not listed in there? Now I'm going to say this verse and most of you are going to know exactly what it is, but turn to the book of Amos. Don't ever misunderstand God, folks. He will give you and I, exactly what we ask for. What has the world asked for for the last, especially more recently, but what, what does the unsaved world ask for? No God, no Bible, no prayer, no religion, no, no sign of, of a higher power, of a higher being. Now what about the nation of Israel? They told God in World War, right before World War I that they could do it themselves. They didn't need God. They were, they were becoming wealthy on their own. So you know what God has done at the end times here? He stepped out. Isn't that what the Laodicean church is all about? The church of the closed door with Jesus Christ outside, knocking to get in, begging to get inside of his own church? We've kicked him out. The Jews have kicked him out. They've rejected his son. So, he said, fine. You don't need me. You don't want me. Have it your way. And you're seeing a world now that is void of God. In Amos chapter 8, verse 11, it says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of the hearing of of the words of the Lord. You know what we're in right now? We're in the midst of a famine. And so what's the book of Esther do? God portraying what is going to take place just before the rapture and just after the rapture and through the seven years of the tribulation, God is not wanted. So he steps out. Now, I'm going to spend more time talking about what God is doing in the book of Esther today so that you understand that he's still working and he's still active. Amen. Let's pray before we get any deeper in this this morning. Father, we thank you so much for everything that you do for our life. Father, we thank you for loving us the way you do, Lord. We thank you for working in our lives the way you do. And Father, I pray this morning that as we begin the process of digging into the book of Esther, Lord, you help us to see what you're really doing in our lives, Lord. When it appears to the world that you're not active, that, that you have completely stepped out, that you have left this world uh, off to itself, Lord, that you help us as Christians see and understand what's really going on. And Lord, we know that there soon will come a time where the Holy Spirit of God is removed off the face of this earth, but in the midst of the church age, you're still working. And you'll still work in the hearts and minds of anybody that wants it, anybody that desires it, Lord. You'll still... 
bring truth to anybody that seeks it. And Lord, I pray this morning that that's where our heart is today. That's where our mind is, Lord, that we want to seek what you have for us in our lives and for our church body and for Christians around the world. We love you, Father. We thank you. And we ask now that you bless this time that we have so that we may give you the honor and glory in return. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let me ask you a simple question. In Romans chapter 11, when Paul explained what he was doing to the nation of Israel, how would anybody know how long that would take? Because God gave the nation of Israel in the Old Testament how long it was going to be until Jesus came the first time. How long would somebody figure out it would be in the second half of, of, the, uh, of time? Well, God gave us a great prophecy. Most of you probably know it in 2 Peter in chapter 3, verse 8. One day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. Well, four days have already passed when, when Paul wrote this in Romans chapter 11, the 4,000 years of the Old Testament. How many days are left? Knowing that there's a thousand years of peace at the end of it. Well, 2,000. If, if anybody was paying attention when, when they finally got Peter's revelation in about 68 A.D., and they begin to lay out the process of time, much like we try to do around here, you find out real quick that there's only 2,000 years left. Now watch how, how interesting this becomes. In Luke chapter, um, where did I write it down? Luke chapter 2 somewhere, or 3, oh there it is, 3.23. Luke chapter 3.23. You know what it says about Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 3, verse 23? When he begins his ministry, he is about... 30 years old. Now, regardless if Jesus Christ was born in 1 AD or 4 BC, it really doesn't matter. Because as soon as Jesus Christ was born, what does AD stand for? In the year of our Lord. That's the English for the Latin. Anna Domino or something, however you pronounce it. So if Jesus was 30 years old, what year would that put you in? 30 A.D. And if you add 2,000 years to that, what happens? You come up with 2030, interestingly enough. You say, yeah, but he died in 33 A.D. He's 33 and a half years old. Yeah, but go to Matthew chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 3. I think I've used this analogy before, but anybody ever see the movie Patch Adams? Remember when he goes into the mental hospital and he's talking to the guy and everybody thinks the guy's crazy that's in there and, and he's really just trying to get people to see and understand what he's really talking about. And he says, how many fingers am I holding up? And, and uh, Patch Adams, played by Robin Williams, he says, well, three. He says, no, look beyond the problem. Well, if you look past your fingers, how many do you actually see? You see double of each finger. You see six. Now, I don't know if the guy was crazy or not in real life, but I, I, that, that whole scene comes into my head all the time when I'm reading the Bible. Because you cannot, yet yeah, you, you have to start there. Look, read the Bible at face value. See what the words say. But you get to a point where you start looking past what is seen at face value. You start to look for what God's really showing you and really saying. This is one of those instances. In Matthew chapter 3, and in verse uh, 16, it says, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending uh, like a dove and lighting, lightning upon him. Lighting, excuse me, upon him. Now we all look at that and say, you know, the dove's a picture of the Holy Spirit, and this was uh, God showing the world that this was his son and all this things, and those are all true. That's the face value application. Now, some people will teach, I don't know if I have a note in here on um, 
I can't remember what the name of it is and who teaches it, but some people will teach that this is when Jesus became God, that prior to this he was just Jesus the man and he became God here. That is absolutely not true. All you have to do is run scripture with scripture and find out that that is completely contradictory to what the Bible says, but just so you, you kind of know that for back of your head. But do you know what's really happening here in Matthew 3.16? Which I always thought was interesting that it's John 3.16 that we run to for salvation. In Matthew 3.16, you know what this verse is for the nation of Israel? This is the moment that Jesus was coronated to become king. From this point forward, you go down the chapters and you see how everything was in preparation for Jesus to become king, and yet the nation of Israel, by Matthew chapter 12 and 13, completely rejected him. The, the, the message of Jesus goes into parabolic form, goes into mystery form, and from that point forward, it's a downhill slide from there. But this is the moment, had the nation of Israel fully understood, based on Daniel and all the, the prophecies in the Old Testament... This is the moment they would have recognized Jesus Christ for who he was, their Messiah, and they would have crowned him right there on the spot and brought him in, set him on the throne. That was his coronation. That's the moment that he should have became, become king. And now God's going to wait 2,000 years and potentially to the year God's going to crown him king. For eternity. Wouldn't that be great? That's what the book of Esther is all about. That transition period. Moving back and getting, uh, getting Jesus Christ seated where he was supposed to be seated all the way back in 30 AD. But that's where we as Christians have to lift up our eyes and make sure that we're seeing what's really going on. Understanding what God's really doing. That's where the book of Esther comes into play. Now, let, let me give you some things about Esther here that are interesting. First of all, we talked about last week, Esther takes place between Ezra chapter 6 and Ezra chapter 7. Here's how the years play out between the, the three books of Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. We've gone through this period. This was the decree of Cyrus in chapter 1. This was the dedication of the temple back to God. In chapter 5 or 6. Then there's a break. Because in chapter 7. We're now in the 7th year. Of a whole different king. Artaxerxes. This was under King Cyrus. And King Darius. This is in Artaxerxes reign. We jump these years. Then in Nehemiah. You're going to cover 12 years. During the reign of. Uh, who is it there? It's still Artaxerxes. For 12 years. But this is where Esther comes in. He splits Ezra between 1 through 6 and 7 through 10. That's where Esther falls in. Now, he, look at the slant that is in the book of Esther. Ten chapters. What's, what's, why is that significant? Ten is the number of the Gentiles. Vashti. You know who Vashti is? In the book of Esther, she's the, the Gentile queen. She's mentioned ten times in the book of Esther. In Ezra, uh, excuse me, I'm gonna, I told you a couple weeks ago I was going to do that all the time. Esther, in Esther, chapter 3, verse 9, there are ten talents of silver. In Esther, chapter 9, verse 10, there are ten sons of Haman. And in Esther, uh, I think it's chapter 3, she is taken into the king's court in the 10th month. And then exactly one year later, she's brought in to the king's chambers in the 10th month. It's all about the number 10. It's about the Gentiles, folks, at least the first part of the book. God is showing you that. Esther has everything to do with the Gentile, but then it ends with a Jewish maiden on the throne. Hmm. There seems to be a major shift. Now, let me give you the cast of characters in the book of Esther. First, Esther herself. She's a Jewish maiden. 
And we're going to get into what her name and everything means here down the road in a week or so. Then you have a, a gentleman by the name of Mordecai who basically raises Esther because her parents both die. It's her cousin. Now Mordecai is going to represent one of two things. Either the two witnesses in the tribulation or the Holy Spirit of God. Kind of a little bit of both. Which obviously the, the two witnesses are going to be led by the Holy Spirit of God in the tribulation. Then you have Queen Vashti, as I mentioned. She's the Gentile queen on the throne when the book opens. Then you have a man by the name of Haman. He's going to represent, and not represent, he is a great type of the Antichrist in the book of Esther. Then you have the king at the time. It was technically Xerxes, but he's called by the name Ahasuerus. Now, a lot of people or some people will say he represents God the Father. I could see it, but I'm also a little bit leery of it, but you can take it for what it's worth. I'll show you I'll show you why they say that as we get into the book. And then you have the overall theme of the book. The overall theme of the book of Esther is this. God is shifting his attention and moving off of off of God's uh prominent seen the Gentiles pictured by Vashti being removed off the throne and he's bringing in and ushering in the nation of Israel and giving them favor again all the while he's protecting the nation of Israel at the same time remember the three the three aspects of what I told you one He's bringing in the Christians. He's giving the last call to the Gentiles. And he's working on restoring the nation of Israel all at the same time. That's everything that's going on in this book. That's what the ten chapters in the book of Ezra, uh, Esther are going to talk about. Now, God showed me this the other day as I was kind of trying to lay this out. You know, in Ezra 1 through 6... This is the first wave of the, the Jews that go back from Babylon to Israel. What you got in the book of Esther are the Jews that are left in Babylon. And then when you get to Ezra chapter 7, you have another wave of Jews that go back. Now, I told you this a couple weeks ago. The order of the books in your Bible are there to show you the overall flow. Ezra and Nehemiah represent Israel going back in 1948 getting preparations to get the city rebuilt, everything back in order. Esther is a picture of the rapture of the church, which takes you into Job, which is 42 chapters of Job being tormented by the adversary, which is a picture of the nation of Israel in the last three and a half years, 42 months of the tribulation, which brings in the book of Psalms, which represents peace and rest, which is the picture of the millennium. But when you look at the chronology, it shows you when those events will take place. You know what you have here? This is 1948, which we already know. But you know what happened in 1948? The first wave of the Jews went back to Israel and reestablished the land. You know when the second major wave of people are going to go back to Israel? Now they're going year by year, it's increasing, but it's not not a huge amount. It's you know a, that's right. It's the end of the tribulation when they leave Sailor Petra and head back up to prepare for the Battle of Armageddon with the second advent. And you know what this book is all about? It's all about setting up the walls and the city again. You know when that's gonna happen? At the beginning of the millennium, they're going to rebuild the city. So you know what this is all about? 
I already told you. It's all about the rapture of the church. There's how the, the timing of the events play out. The chronology shows you the order, or excuse me, the order of the book shows you the flow. The chronology shows you when. Now, we've, we've done a lot of, of numberings uh, based on the years and things. I'm not going to belabor that, that point. But there are, if you look at, and I'll, I'll share some of them along the way, the book of Esther basically covers, in theory, it's only nine years, but they celebrate the Feast of Pur, Purim right after um, uh, Hanukkah, which would be after the New Year. Really, the book ends in 474. But they celebrate Purim in 473. So it's, it's a 10-year span. Guys, if you start to line up, and Ahasuerus takes the throne in 486. So it's really a 12-year span. If you start to line up events that have happened around our world in the last 12, well, from 20, 30, back 12 years, it starts to get a little coincidental, man, I say. <clears throat> So we can look at some of those things as we go along. But understand this. And here's what, here's what I want to talk about for the remainder of the time today. I mentioned that God is not mentioned in the book of Esther. Neither is the word Lord. But don't think for one second that God is not working behind the scenes to orchestrate everything he wants done exactly the way he wants done it all through that book. And quite frankly, this is probably one of his most favorite books. Now, maybe I just say that because I'm partial because it talks about the rapture, represents the rapture. But you got to understand, he's restoring his bride in the book of Esther. There are only two books in your Bible that are named after a woman, and they both are tied around a marriage. One of them is Ruth, that's a picture of the Gentiles marrying a, a type of Jesus Christ, and, and it's a picture of the church. Somebody becoming a Christian out of the world system and marrying the Lord Jesus Christ. And then you have the next book, Esther, is about a Jewish maiden who marries a Gentile king. It's the restoration of an entire nation of people who just happens to be God's people, which is a picture of God restoring his wife to himself and preparing for the day that he turns over to her every single promise that he ever had in store for her. I got to think it's probably one of his favorite books. What I want to talk to you and I about this morning is the fact that in our lives, even we may not think God's there when we can't see God, we can't hear God, we can't uh, feel God. We, we It seems like we're lost and we're out on an abandoned island somewhere. That he's still working to coordinate everything to be just the way it needs to be in your life. Every single time. Once you've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, there's not one millisecond of time that goes by that God's not working some, hate, some way, somehow in our lives. Now, we may be working against Him at times, but that doesn't mean He stops. He's still setting everything up and coordinating everything so that it comes out the exact way He wants. You know, when it comes to our life, when it comes to all this, God has an end point. You know what that end point is? It's his son sitting on the throne in Mount Zion for a thousand years. That's his end point on this earth. Everything that's happened since Genesis chapter 3 has been for that. And folks, everything that's happened in our life since you were conceived in the womb, is for one purpose, and that's to get you to that marriage supper of the Lamb that Ezra pictures so delicately on the other side, and to get you standing there before Jesus Christ, His Son, and to join hands with His Son, and to become His bride for all eternity. That's all He cares about. Everything else is just details. It's just sand in the hourglass that's filling in the... You ever seen that little uh, little trick they do? They they take a jar. And the first thing they do is put big rocks in it. 
and they get as many rocks in there as they can. You can't get any more rocks in there. And people look at it and say, well, it's full. You say, well, no, it's not. Then you take little, little grains of gravel and you drop them in and they fall down and fill in everywhere they can, but they still can't fill everything. And then the last thing they do is they take sand and they fill it and it goes down and fills every single crevice that's left in between every piece of rock and every piece of pea gravel and there are no voids left in that jar after you drop that sand in. That's life, folks. God does not miss a detail. And when we think the jar is full, he drops in smaller grains of rock. And when we think the jar is full, he brings in the sand. Never ending. God is working in our life every single minute of every single day for one purpose. Not so we can have the most joyous life that we can have down here on earth. Although, because God in His great sovereignty allows for a lot of people for us to have a wonderful life here and enjoy a lot of great things and have, have a lot of great opportunities in life, depending on where you're born around the world. That should be counted a blessing. That's not a necessity. That's not a right that we have. I hear people, and I heard it all through all the COVID stuff, they'd stand up and say, it's our sovereign right. Folks, we have this much sovereign rights. Anything we get beyond the breath we have, and even still at that, it's a blessing from God. And we should count it as that. Now, I want to give you three things that God's doing uh, or that, that in our life that typically we look at sometimes and we wonder if God's even there. And I want to show you how God is always there. And there are, there are dozens of, of applications we could go to in, in the Bible to lay these out, but I try to narrow it down to a few more practical ones. But understanding that no matter where we are, no matter what we're doing, no matter how lonely we think we are or we feel, God's there. Now the first aspect I want to talk to you about, which is probably the, the one I hear the most, is our prayer life. And some of you probably even said it yourself, well, I just don't feel like God's hearing what, I, what I'm saying. I don't feel like he, he hears what my prayers are. Folks, he hears every single one of them. Now, it may not be in the timing we look for. It may not be in the, the aspect we look for. But if you ask, the gears start moving. Now, a lot of times the problem may be that, like Romans chapter 8 says, we don't know how to pray. It's one of our infirmities in the flesh. Our prayer should be more of based around, Lord, help me understand what is going on here, what you're doing here. Help me understand how I can be used in it. Instead of, Lord, this is what I need. Lord, this is what I'm looking for. Lord, give me an answer. No, Lord, help me to see and understand what you're trying to do in this particular situation. Now, I will give you a little side note so we don't, you know, we keep everything balanced. What's, what's the... Uh, Constellation of the scales. Libra. Is that, is that Libra? Yeah, Libra. Got to be a little Libra in our life here. <clears throat> How do I say this carefully? We went, we went to Branson and uh, we did the wax hands. You know, where you get your hand, dip it like six times in the wax and back in the eyes. The guy told me I could keep my ring on. I was going to take it off. And first of all, uh, it ended up destroying the, the – Casey and I locked our hands, you know, and we were we sweet together. and We stuck our hands in together. <clears throat> we were going to set it up on the mantle for everybody to see how much we love each other. But when he was pulling it off, the ring caught the wax, and it, like, completely destroyed part of my left hand. But on top of that, when we stuck it in the hot wax, it it heated up my ring, and it – 
caused a blister inside her fingers from my ring. Felt real bad, but and all that we didn't even get anything out of it because there was such a long line we didn't want to go back after it tore up because it, it takes a few minutes. But anyway, the purpose in all that is to tell you that I don't even remember now. I just wanted to share with you our love story about how we. No, it's it's like dealing with the wax. You're trying to get it off your hand after you've you've hardened it in the ice and making sure it doesn't break. God is working for our purpose. Don't misunderstand what I'm getting ready to say. But understand to a greater degree, God has one main purpose behind everything he does. Uh, physically, it's this. Spiritually, for you and I, it's to keep God, to keep Jesus Christ edified and glorified above all else. So, when God's working in our life, you may get a gain out of it. I may get a blessing out of it. But understand, it's that's not the end game purpose. The end game purpose is to bring glorification to His Son. So when we pray, we need to understand that our prayers need to be situated around that fact. Understanding that how is my life, how is the answer I'm going to get for what I'm looking for, or what God's trying to do, going to bring honor and glory to Jesus Christ. You know, I would, I would bet to say that the reason a lot of Christians fall short in getting the full blessing that God has for them in their life, because they stop at, how is it going to benefit me? And God says, well, I can't work past that blinder. As soon as you remove that and understand that what I'm doing in your life is not for you, although I will give you a blessing out of it because I do love you as my son, the end game is to get Jesus Christ glorified through what I'm going to do in you. But let me take you to Luke, or uh, let's start in Matthew chapter 26. I thought, well, why not use probably the greatest example of prayer we got in our Bible? Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26, 36 says this, Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And in verse 39 he says, And he went a little further, and he fell on his face, and he prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And then in verse 42, he says, And he went again the second time, and he prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And then in verse 44, he says, And he left them and went away and prayed the third time, saying those same words. Then cometh he to his disciples and saith unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand. And the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, and let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. I mean, what better prayer do you get than the prayer out of the mouth of Jesus Christ when he's about to face eternal judgment? And yet you find out in Luke chapter 22. Flip over there real quick. In Luke chapter 22, verse 41, he says, And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed. Now this is the same prayer. I just get a few more details in it. Saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And in verse 44, it says, And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Folks, this wasn't just a, a prayer because... I'm looking for some direction. I'm looking for some for some help. This was prayer because his life literally hung in the balances 
He wasn't searching for just some answer. He was searching for an eternal movement. But notice in the midst of that, in verse 44, or excuse me, 43, it says, And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. Folks, understand, first of all, this in your prayer life. God spoke not a word to Jesus Christ through this period of time. But you know what God did? He sent him an angel to be strengthened, to strengthen him. The Bible tells us, uh, 1 or 2 Corinthians, that God will never give us more than we can handle. That includes our prayer life. That includes the, the agony of life circumstances that we come up against. And let me, let me tell you right now, most of you have gone through a lot more than I've had to go through in my life. I can almost promise you. God's been good to me. And I thank Him for that every single day. So I don't stand up here and pretend to, that I'm some Christian martyr that's gone through hell and back because of this and that and the other. No, He's been very good to me. But I know, and I'm sure some of you can attest, that in your weakest times, in your most trying times, something comes along to give you strength. And I know exactly what it is. Now, it may not have been a physical angel. It might have been the Holy Spirit. But you know, in the Old Testament, Jesus Christ is called the angel of the Lord. So it's some form of an angel. Now, even though Jesus received no answer, look at verse uh, uh, chapter 23 in the same book, Luke. He got no answer from God in his prayer life in the most detrimental, agonizing period of time he ever had. And the people that were doing it to him, look what he says in verse 34. Then Jesus, then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He kept on praying. His prayer changed, but he kept on praying. Now, if anybody ever had the excuse to say, well, I just don't feel like God's answering my prayer. It was Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane when the whole world was turned against Him. But God never left Him. God just knew that there was an end product that He was trying to achieve, and that was to give you and I the opportunity to have salvation. Flip back over to Matthew 27 real quick. Matthew 27, verse 44. Uh, go 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Elia, Elia, lama sabachthani, thani. That is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Last prayer Jesus prayed. And yet God didn't answer. But God was working. And He wasn't just working for Jesus. He was working for all of humanity. He was working for the nation of Israel. Still. Because He still gave them an opportunity. In Acts chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. And He was working for the Gentiles. Because He then provided the next 2,000 years for the opportunity to that anybody that would want to have eternal life that could come to Jesus Christ and bow before Him and accept the prayers that Jesus prayed on the cross and make Him theirs. You know one prayer that a saved person will never have to pray? My God, my God, why hast Thou forsaken me? Now that will be the prayer of the unsaved person at the white throne judgment, but God will look him straight in the eyes and say, Son, that prayer has already been prayed. Do 
just because you don't feel like you get a verbal response from God, don't misunderstand that all the circumstances that are working around you are for your gain and glory so that at the end of the day, you can be blessed and then Jesus Christ can receive glorification. He's still working. The next aspect that God's always working in our life is the purpose for why you're here. Now I'm running out of time, but I'll give you some references. In Acts chapter 8, there was a, a, a man by the name of Saul. And he stood by and not only watched, he was consenting unto the death of Stephen, who was just murdered by the Jewish government in Acts chapter 7 because he, he dared to stand and speak the name of Jesus. And it says he cons Saul was standing there consenting unto his death. Now Paul, that ate Paul to the day he died. You know how I know that? Because I got six verses here. Galatians chapter 1, 13. Galatians 1, 23. 1 Corinthians 15, 9. Acts 26, 11. Acts 22, 4. And there may be more. At least six times that Paul brings up during his ministry about who he was before he got saved and what he allowed to happen under his watch before he got saved. Things he never forgot. I don't know if he ever truly felt like he ever got forgiven for those things. But in Acts chapter 26, God was able to turn around and use it for glory. 26, verse 16. It says, But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the, in the which I will appear unto thee. Now this is Paul rehashing what happened in, in Acts chapter 9 when Jesus Christ met him on the road to Damascus. And you know what he's doing? He's witnessing to Agrippa. I think you guys talked about that last week a little bit with Ryan. And then uh, verse 17 says, Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and the inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Paul is tell telling Agrippa and those listening about who he was, but then about what God did for him, even in the midst of Paul standing there basically being a murderer. And he's now using that as a testimony to try to lead other people to Jesus Christ. It's all right. Was that AI? Does he like not like what I'm saying? <clears throat> Paul is understanding, or has come to a point at least in his life, where he understood that the things that went on in the flesh, God was going to turn around and use to somehow give Jesus Christ glory. Never misunderstand that the things God is doing in our lives are for an exact purpose. Even when we're not sure what's going on. Caught between jobs, losing a job, Losing family members, whatever. I mean, just some of the most tragic circumstances that life brings. We look at and say, why? And that's okay. Life is hard. But never misunderstand that God is not working an angle for a specific purpose for what's happening in our life at that moment. Every moment, there's a purpose. And when we get to a point where we can understand and see that somehow God's trying to get the honor and glory out of what's happening for a greater purpose, well, I just might say that's what becoming a true servant of God is like. That's servanthood. We think servanthood is out 
grinding the pavement and, and working for Jesus, and that's part of it. But a true servant is allowing God to use you in whatever situation, scenario befalls you in life, and somehow allowing God to get the honor and glory out of it. That's what a real servant is. Purpose. First, you all know very well. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Everything God is doing in your life is for one purpose. In our lives, for one purpose. And then the last one, this might be my favorite. God's promises. You know, all the way back in Genesis chapter 13, God promised Abraham. Well, he started it in chapter 12, but in chapter 13, he promised that his seed would be his, the number of the grains of sand. He also promised Abraham that he would give him a land that flowed with milk and honey. Neither of those two promise have, promises have come to full fruition yet. You realize that? They're still in the process. We are six, that well, at that particular time, it's probably about 2000 BC. So we're 4,000 years into this promise. And it still hasn't come to full fruition. Folks, don't mistake that when it might seem like God's not listening, when it might seem like God's not working, when it might seem like God doesn't hear you, when it might seem like God's nowhere to be found, like it appears in the book of Esther, so much so that people have had to sit down and rewrite the book of Esther and add to the book of Esther and change the book of Esther to put God in it and to put the word Lord into it because they just couldn't fathom that a book in the Bible would not mention the name God or the name Lord. That represents a period of time in our life where we just feel alone and we feel without God, but all the while God is working all the circumstances and He's maneuvering all the people. Because there is a plan, there's a purpose, and there's a promise. God promised you eternal life. So everything He's doing in your life and in my life is to fulfill that promise. And what father? Jesus Christ even talks about this. Don't you give your kids good gifts for Christmas? What father wants you to stand at the judgment seat and be standing there naked with no inheritance, no rewards, no cloak, no crowns? What father would want that of you? We would look at that on this side of things and say, wow, what a terrible parent. Folks, you've got to understand that everything God is doing in your life is to fulfill the promise to give you the greatest eternity that God could ever have imagined for anybody. That's the reason he created this whole thing anyway. To create a group of people and a, and a, and a, a creation that would want to worship and serve him. God has promises in store for every one of us. Don't ever lose sight of that. Don't ever lose the the foresight to know that what God is doing in our lives, even in the lowest of the valleys, it's God fulfilling His promise to you that He made to you directly. It talks about in the book of Esther about there being a, a covenant, a king's seal. And when that king sealed a, a commandment in the Old Testament, it was set in stone forever. You could not change it. And it almost came to the nation of Israel's complete detriment. They almost got eradicated because of that king's seal. And I believe you and I are told in the book of Ephesians that if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you are now sealed. Can't take that promise back. 
And it's not just about getting you there. It's about wanting you to get there and having all the grandeur of everything he ever imagined you to have. Because he promised it. Close out with this. Matthew chapter 17. You may not see God physically, but you got to understand, folks, that his handprint is on every single aspect of your life, every single day. And in Matthew chapter 17, and in verse 8, And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. You know what we got to do as Christians, folks? Lift up your eyes. Get it above the people. That's on the other side now. Save Jesus only. Lift up your eyes and see Jesus Christ. Set your affections on things above. And understand, folks, that no matter what is happening, and I know it's easier said than done. No matter what you're going through, no matter what you're feeling, no matter what you're experiencing, no matter what's happening, God's always working in your life. He's answering your prayers. He's fulfilling your purpose. And He's trying to carry out His promise to you. Let's pray. Father, thank You so much for everything You do for each and every one of us. Father, thank You for this book. God, I feel so foolish when I stand up here and open this book because I feel like I'm looking into a deep, dark pit that goes down for eternity, Lord. I just, I scramble to try to find something that, that can rationalize any sense because it's just so deep and so thick. But Father, I know that when we just allow you to work through us, you'll portray exactly what you need said. You'll carry out exactly what needs to be carried out. And Lord, I pray that as we move into the holiday season, which can be some of the most depressing times for a lot of people, Lord, I thank you that you put people in our lives like the Show Me Home so we can, we can reach out and, and try to help make their holiday season more special, Lord. And I pray that you just be with those that fall into that time of loneliness, that, Father, we would see that when we're out and about. We could look in people's eyes and realize that they're they're hurting and they're empty and they're just searching for something they can grab onto, Lord. Let us be the light that can deliver them something real that they can grasp, not only to get through the moment they're in, but grasp for eternity. And Lord, I pray that you help us to know that no prayer of ours ever goes unheard. And that you never just throw us out in the cold and leave us and say, hope you figure it out for yourself, Lord. There's always a purpose behind what you're doing. And Lord, at the end of the day, it's all so that you can fulfill a purpose, or excuse me, fulfill a promise that you made to each and every one of us. God, we thank you for everything you do for us. We thank you for loving us the way you do, Lord. And I pray now that you keep us safe as we go out and that you just help us to continue to lean on you and rely on you for our source of strength so at the end of the day, you might receive all glory and honor. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.